Good morning, everybody, once again. Um, my talk today will be about multimodal locomotion for ocean world analogs. And so I'd like to introduce you to the Robo Simeon rover, which Olivier was referring to in his question pre briefly. Uh, much like Hendrick's uh, Spacebok robot, it's a limbed rover, does, um, but however, it's got these wheels at the end of each limb. And so what I'll be focusing in, on in this talk today is if you were to send a robot to an ocean world, such as Europa or Enceladus, um, how would you traverse around the surface? So let me... So this is the ocean world Europa. Europa uh, is one of the most exciting prospects for exploration, for robotic exploration specifically, um, in the coming future. Uh, it is a world that's composed of an ocean with an icy crust. And we've received images of uh, Europa, or the surface of Europa from the Galileo spacecraft, uh, but these only go down to about a six meter uh, resolution. So it's a, we have a relatively uncertain knowledge of the, the European terrain. Um, however, some smart scientists have identified various terrestrial analogs that we think are like the surface of Europa. And these terrestrial analogs have been identified as glacier ice, uh, these shard-like structures develop, um, de seen in South America called penitentes, um, formed by sublimation. Uh, salt evaporites, so salt uh, bubbling up through the, the crust um, and forming these nodular gnarly structures. Uh, chaos terrain, which you see at the at ice falls um, at the bases of glaciers. And finally, boring old regolith. Um, so specifically, we're looking at cryogenic ice regolith. Um, so when we consider the Europa exploration problem, uh, NASA JPL is sending the Europa Clipper mission to, to uh, get a better knowledge of the European surface and also determine what the characteristics of the subsurface ocean are. Um, and then following on from Clipper, we might have this mission called Europa Lander, which will look for direct signs of life on the European surface. Now, uh, this would be a, quite, a, quite a transformative mission. However, it will be delivered by what's called the Sky Crane, um, which what is what delivered Curiosity to the surface of Mars and what will be delivering Perseverance to the surface of Mars in February. Um, however, this, this may contaminate the region around the, the, the landing region. So hypothetically, we could have uh, Further on from Europa Lander, we could have this Europa Mobile Surface Explorer, which is very much a hypothetical agent. Um, but we, we've been studying mobility on these ocean, Europa analog surfaces um, to get a better idea of what's possible and um, what mobility uh, strategies we need to navigate uh, these European analogs. So, the first analog that we, we've been testing our robot on is, is at Dev the Devil's Golf Course in Death Valley. And um, this analog was selected because of these really uh, crazy salt evaporite structures. Here you can see um, the, our team member Gareth uh, standing in the middle of these salt evaporite, this salt evaporite field. Um, so the question was, could we get a robot to traverse terrain like this. Then we also went out to a glacier in Alaska. There's me for scale uh, standing um, at, at the section of the glacier where we tested the robot. And finally, we've been using a sand slope uh, as a regular simulant um, at, at our JPL Mars yard, which is a, a, anywhere between a 15 and 20 degree slope on this sand slope. So previous work um, on on this on problem similar to this, um, and more specifically on wheel on limb mobility have included uh, David Wettergreen's work at CMU with the Scarab Rover, um, where they de demonstrated the effectiveness of push rolling or inchworming, uh, the Athlete Rover at JPL, 
Um, our colleagues at DFKI developed the Sherpa TT rover, which you saw briefly yesterday. And my PhD work was focused on this rover called Mammoth, uh, where we demonstrated some autonomous navigation and planning um, with these wheel on limb, uh, versatile wheel on limb platforms. So we've been using this robot called RoboSimian. RoboSimian was developed not for the mobility problem, but it was developed for the DARPA uh, robotics challenge where it was designed as a search and rescue robot. It had to drive a car, open doors, turn valves. Um, and it did quite well in, in this uh, scenario. But since then, we've modified RoboSimian uh, to become a wheel on limb system. And uh, here you can see, see it on the right um, as, in, as its wheel on limb incarnation. And it's got uh, eight degree of, it's got eight degrees of freedom in each limb. It's got force torque sensors at the each event end of each limb. And we're quite proud of these compliant spring wheels, which were a NASA development um, at Glenn Research Center. Um, and they've been shown to perform quite nicely on this analog terrain. So we move the robustimian limbs around um, using a lookup table um, where we where we move uh, in this predefined workspace. Um, and this gives us one, a one-to-one -one mapping between a, a joint space and, uh, and workspace. And uh, this also gives us repeatable motions um, and uh, repeatable reliable motions uh, that can be validated and verified. Um, so what we, what we started with was we went out to Death Valley and we did a mobility mode evalu evaluation and we tested on varying si sites of vari with varying degrees of difficulty. Here you can see a in one, you can see a relatively flat terrain and then we progressively get harder and harder. And we wanted to see, A, could, could the mobility modes that we designed for RoboSimian, could they traverse this type of terrain? And also how efficient were they in terms of energy efficiency? And for this trial, we used a metric of centimeters per kilojoule. And so here you can, in these videos, you can see RoboSimian driving over the salt of apparites with an actively articulated suspension controller. Um, so that RoboSimian actively conforms its limbs to the terrain as it's traversing it. And then we use this mode called inchworming, which was developed, uh, which was originally demonstrated by the Scarab, um, one of the original demonstrations. And finally, we used a mode called wheel walking, where one limb is pushed forward at a time, and then the whole body is pulled forward, and we repeat this gait. And we weren't too surprised to see that driving with actively articulated suspension is the most energy efficient mode uh, for, for each of the terrains that we tested on, but it was followed uh, quite closely by the inchworming mobility mode. This is work that was reported in field and service robotics last year. Um, then we went out to Matanuska. Uh, we dropped, we had our own version of the sky crane maneuver where we dropped RoboSimian underneath the helicopter onto the ice. And we set up a base camp out here. You can see RoboSimian there and zoom, zoomed in. Um, and we chose various sites with varying degrees of incline on this hard packed ice. Um, Site 1B was it was about a 10 degree incline. Site 1C was a nodular incline terrain, while 1A was flat, and 2A had these uh, these ridges um, uh, to try and exploit the effectiveness of limb mobility. Um, and once again, we at the second site we we chose this varying degrees of roughness and incline. So each of these uh, videos shows the four mobility modes that we tested on the ice. Um, we had wheel rolling without actively articulated suspension, then wheel rolling with articulated suspension, inchworming and wheel walking once again. Um, so what we found was, the results we found were pretty similar to our Death Valley results. I, excuse me, the, these uh, efficiency, the efficiency metric used here is in kilojoules per meter. So it's inverted uh, from, the pre, from the previous trial. Um, and what we, we saw on the, the terrain where it could do, just driving without any uh, suspension was very effective. Um, and then we noticed that um, the driving uh, with actively articulated suspension inchworming uh, followed uh, uh, soon afterwards. 
Um, well, I just wanted to highlight that in each of our uh, um, limbed mobility modes, so wheel walking and inch warming, we also use actively articulated suspension. So at all times, the rover is trying to keep contact with the terrain and keep its orientation uh, in roll and pitch level. So this video, oh, excuse me, this video demonstrates one of the most, one of the trickier traverses we accomplished with Robo Simeon on the ice. And it shows uh, Robo Simeon going over this uh, side slope with, which is quite slippery um, with uh, all of these ridges in there. So you can see it really has to extend its limbs to keep contact with the terrain. And in the graph on the right, we can see that it actually saturates uh, its limb reach, um, especially for limb one and limb four um, in some circumstances. So we're really pushing it to the limits of its suspension uh, capabilities. But we were quite happy to see that, that this actively articulated suspension worked quite, quite effectively on this icy sloped uh, undulating and, and ridged terrain. Another experiment that we performed uh, was to demonstrate the effectiveness, effectiveness of multimodal switching. So this was a manual test, but we identified this, this trough here where RoboSumine goes into it with actively articulated driving and it gets stuck uh, in its back, um, when its back wheels go into the rut. And so it can't progress forward. And so I'm off camera and I instructed it to start uh, wheel walking and it still uh, stayed stuck. But in doing so, it pushed its center of mass forward. And then we instructed an inchworming maneuver and it was able to pull itself out of this rut. So this uh, was, is a good demonstration of uh, when uh, these limbed mobility modes could be used or this ability to move your center of mass around is quite useful. Um, so the next question is, how do you do this autonomously, um, which we've been addressing over the past year. Another experiment that we performed, uh, which uh, uh, briefly go over is this sampling of ice cores. So we use the RoboSimian, oh sorry, we use the RoboSimian to lower itself down and offload a drill inside this box at the back and we grab an ice core um, and we deliver it into a science, uh, science package on the robot. Um, but this wasn't really to do with mobility, um, but it was a nice demonstration of the utility of RoboSimian for science. Now, since these two uh, field trials, we've been modifying our mobility modes a bit, and we've developed this sculling mode with its this giant belly underneath it. Um, sculling, uh, we've developed for use in really deformable terrain, um, uh, where it can put its, its pressure uh, on its belly um, while propelling itself forward. Um, we also have this walking with actively articulated uh, mode, actively articulated suspension mode. Um, which uh, is much similar, well, it's a static gait like Hendrik was talking about before, but it enables us to pick our limbs up out of, out of ruts and out, out of this nodular terrain that we, we saw um, in, in the salt evaporite fields. And then also we've been looking at using switchback driving for going up deformable terrain slopes, um, which is shown to be relatively effective. Um, oh, sorry, this slide was repeated twice. Um, really, uh, for deformable terrain slopes, uh, we, we found the most effective mode so far has been inchworming. Uh, this, these two videos uh, compare um, inchworming and driving with actively articulated suspension. And you can really see how inchworming is able to really progress up the, up the, the slope with li limited slip while while driving um, it gets embedded. So the last thing I'd like to talk about today is our most recent field trial out to Death Valley pre just before the pandemic hit. And what we, what we, uh, what motivated this field trial was how do we make things autonomous? How do we get a, a robot uh, like RoboSimian to traverse a Europe analog terrain by itself? And we gave it a point cloud, much like Europa Lander would have during its descent. And we ran a sampling based bit star algorithm um, over this terrain, and, which was uh, cognate of, of the capabilities of RoboSimian 
And here you see Robosimian following this autonomously selected path um, over this really quite rough, challenging terrain. And once again, here's another example of a terrain site with, with less nodular features, but probably more significant uh, height obstacles. Um, and you can see Robosimian uh, chooses a path that, especially in this section where it has to traverse this ridge line, it actually turns on the spot to, to get a more favorable traverse angle over, over the ridge. So uh, the results of this trial showed us we, we traversed uh, a total distance of 435 meters uh, autonomously. We did have uh, relatively significant failure rates of 0.64 failures per 10 meters, where we either got stuck in, in the terrain or uh, we, we just overheated, um, or the terrain actually collapsed on us. So this is something that we're focusing on next. How do we address these embedding scenarios, which you see here, where we snag the wheels and snag the structure of the robot on this really gnarly terrain? So lessons learned so far, um, we've got to become more immune to these hub snags. Um, wheel contact angle estimation would, would help a lot, especially when it regards to controlling the center of mass of the platform. Um, we tethered the robot for power. We don't have batteries on the robot um, for historical reasons. And um, we really want to, Robosimian, as Olivier highlighted before, is quite a complicated design in that it has eight degrees of freedom per limb. And we, we know we can get away with say five or four degrees of freedom per limb. And we, we want to, for the next step, we want to design a new system that has a much sim more simplified kinematics um, and, can that, and can hopefully be a more reliable system. And the major lesson learned this year is planning uh, ro robot field trials, trials during pandemics is uh, quite a challenge, um, but I'm sure you're all familiar with that lesson. Um, so uh, for the con conclusions so far, um, we, We've demonstrated uh, actively articulated multimodal locomotion on Europa analog terrains. And we've also demonstrated an autonomous capability, um, and which we have a lot of lessons that we've learned that um, we're going to apply to future work. So thank you for your time and um, I'll open it to questions. Yeah, thanks Will for this very exciting talk. Um, we have one question from the chat. Um, so first of all, he wants to congratulate you on the work. Um, it's really amazing to see this robot. And then Kagri Kilic has also a question about uh, um, how do you measure and estimate wheel slippage on these terrains? Do you have four sensors or do you use visual odometry? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. I, I, uh, I didn't have enough time to go into that. But if for our autonomous navigation, we've got a LiDAR on the front of RoboSimian, which you, um, is a Velodyne 16-line uh, uh, LiDAR. And we run LiDAR, LiDAR based SLAM with that system. Um, and also for, our, for the first set of energy efficiency trials, we actually use VO uh, with stereo cameras on board. So we've got multi, multiple sensor modalities on board. Um, and we've also, we've also got a GPS for ground truth, a differential GPS for ground truth. 